All right, everyone. So for those of you who are joining um, and who I haven't actually had an ability to be able to meet just yet, my name is Carla Ruiz. I am a counselor here at Glendale Community College, and I'm also the cultural diversity coordinator um, for the different uh, heritage months, uh, recognition months that we have throughout the academic year. Um, this is the third event that we have in our Latinx Heritage Month planning. Um, our final event will be on Tuesday uh, with our student panel. So we're going to go ahead and just do um, an introduction uh, uh, of our panelists for today. Um, so I want to first introduce Gil Gilbert Campos. He was born and raised in Echo Park. Um, he's a high school graduate whose current role is a project engineer for a general contractor named Westport. Um, they specialize in affordable housing and multifamily housing in the greater Los Angeles area. And his hobbies are currently playing soccer and guitar. So please help me welcome Gilbert. <laughs> um, we also have joining all, all the way from Arizona, um, Norma Armenta. She is a senior multimedia consultant for Sierra H Broadcasting. Um, she actually holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from UCLA, go Bruins, <laughs> um, and has a passion for spin classes, drip to the beat. <laughs> um, she has over 30 years of experience in marketing and advertising field working directly for brands um, on behalf of brands as well and on the media side of business, currently offering radio and digital advertising to business owners, marketing managers, and advertising agencies. So please help me welcome Norma. <laughs> Thank you. And then we also have Dr. Ernesto Leon, uh, currently working in the field of advertising and promotion regulatory affairs, uh, holding a position at um, Kite Pharma um, at Gilead Company. His academic journey began with a bachelor's of science in biology with an emphasis on molecular biology and physiology from Cal State Long Beach, go beach, um, following, uh, followed by a PhD in pharmacology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, during his doctoral tenure, Ernesto specialized in CRT, CART cell immuno research, which I'm sure he'll explain further. Wow. <laughs> um, the same focus of Kite Pharma. Um, beyond his academic pursuits, he likes to explore diverse cultures through travel and hanging out with friends and playing cards. So welcome, Dr. Leon. <laughs> And last but not least, we have Heidi Quintanilla, who is an accomplished educator with over a decade of experience, currently serving as an instructional intervention coach at an elementary charter school in East Los Angeles. She earned her bachelor's degree in child and adolescent development at Cal State Northridge and later obtained her master's of education along with teaching credential from UCLA. Heidi's extensive background includes four years of mentorship work with college freshmen, complemented by five years as a dedicated fifth grade bilingual teacher. In her leisure time, Heidi dabbles as a digital artist, creating captivating digital prints for family and friends using Procreate. <laughs> Please welcome all of our panelists for today, and thank you all for being here today. Um, so I kind of want to just start off today um, and just allowing you all to be able to, you know, introduce yourselves, um, state, you know, your education, um, which we did a little, but if there's anything in addition that um, you want to add that maybe I missed, um, and then what you currently do in your position um, in your jobs. I will throw it to Gilbert. All right, hello everyone. Um, yeah, so as stated, my name is Gilbert Campos. I and, you know, we build around Los Angeles for affordable and market rate housing the affordable um the affordable side of the list more for uh homeless interim housing and uh and you know just and just like section eight i guess and i guess other than that i mean i started off about five years ago and i've been in the same position since currently trying to move up towards project management if nobody's actually heard about what project engineer neither had i it's pretty much the guys inside the trailer that help out with uh RFIs, you know, um, an assistant to the project manager who deals with the overall budget, an assistant to the superintendent who deals with the um, day to day build and mostly just the gatekeeper as far as documents go. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Norma, would you like to share? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm Norma Armenta. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And, um, and so, yes, I went to UCLA, born and raised in Los Angeles, and I was 
always interested in the media and the radio. You know, LA is the number two market um, in, in the country. And then, um, so I was always interested in, the, in music too. So by working I, uh, in radio, I get to, you know, uh, have fun because I get access to tickets to all the concerts and festivals and, and so forth. But so after college, I moved to Tucson, Arizona. Okay. And I started in radio advertising and I, in Tucson mainly dealt with small um, business owners. And, um, and then there was a, a client of mine that recruited me to go work for them. And so I've been on both the media side and on the advertiser um, side. And currently I'm um, back in, um, in media and I do, uh, my passion is to help the, the small business owners that you know, really you know appreciate and value my guidance and my direction when it comes to both marketing and advertising. And then I also work with, you know, marketing colleagues that, you know, regional size businesses that have a full-time person, you know, in their marketing department. And then as well as, you know, uh, large advertising agencies. Um, so I get to work with different um, sizes of businesses. Thank you, Norma. Yeah, huge change of moving from LA to to Arizona. So that's um, really interesting to see and learn a little more about the media side. Heidi, would you like to continue? Yeah, sure. So once again, my name is Heidi Quintanilla. Um, and so my background um, is, in, or my educational background, um, I have a BA in Child and Adolescent Development from CSUN. And then I got my uh, master's in education along with my teaching credential at UCLA. Um, so I've always been interested in education and like social services. Um, so I was a fifth grade bilingual teacher for five years. And last year, I finally made the jump and <laughs> I uh, kind of explored other options. And so currently, I'm an instructional and intervention coach at elementary school. Um, so what that means essentially is I'm the lead at the school for instructional support. So I help develop teachers, paraprofessionals, um, when it comes to their skills in English language arts, math, classroom management, um, and so on. Um, but I'm also um, the lead for the intervention program at the school. So I've also been in charge of creating a system and structure for what our, our intervention program looks like, in addition to also providing intervention services um, for the students with the highest academic needs in the school. Um, so that's been a work in progress because my role is new at that school. So it's been really cool to kind of help develop that. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, it really entails a lot of coaching and professional development for the staff. Um, and I also act as part of the leadership team. So I am also there um, in somewhat of an adm administrator capacity. Wow, incredible. That's a huge role to take on, um, being able to train others um, and develop others as they're trying to grow into their career and being a teacher. It's not easy. Everyone, you know, here um, might have experience in instruction. We have instructional faculty and I'm sure they know that it's not always easy. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Hi, Haiti, right? Haiti. Um, and then I'll take it over to Ernesto. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thanks again for the invitation. Um, so my name is Ernesto. I was born and raised in Southern California, not Southern California, South LA. So Gardena area, went to school in Long Beach, um, where I started doing research. Um, I was initially planning to go to pharmacy school just because pharmacy just really caught my eye in the fact that like medications can help people. Um, so I was a farm tech for like five years in undergrad, but you know, halfway through, I decided that I was more interested in research after doing some summer like starting to do some research. And so I started to do immunology and that's where I kind of learned about the role of the immune system and so many diseases and how we can kind of train the immune system and do all of these cool, crazy things with them. And so I decided to go to grad school all the way across to the other side, uh, to North Carolina, which was a huge move for me, uh, very different culturally and very different just being away from family and friends. Uh, but I did my PhD out there, focused my research on CAR T cell immunotherapy. So CAR T cells is pretty much, uh, you know, teaching your immune system how to fight and recognize cancer. And so, you know, once you do that, you're able to reintroduce these back into the patient and then, you know, potentially cure cancer. And so I was really interested by in doing that. And I decided to come back to California and join Kite Pharma, which is a uh, 
pharmaceutical company that focuses on this type of technology, this new kind of like cell and gene therapy technology. And in my current role, I work in regulatory affairs, which is a little bit different because I was at the bench for about eight years and now I'm off of the bench. So not no longer working with my hands and pipetting and all of that. But now what I do in my current role is that I work with the marketing team, the legal team and the medical team. And we review all of the materials that are disseminated to both patients or no, not just both, but like health, patients, healthcare providers, payers. And so all the information that comes out to doctors and patients, we review it to make sure that it, it is accurate and that all of the information is on there for you to make an informed decision. Um, and I also work with the medical team to be able to review the accuracy medically to make sure that all the information, again, is medically accurate. Um, that's a bulk of my work, but I also work on doing work, creating some systems and processes to like enhance that uh, system. Um, and yeah, so I guess if you like look at the commercials that you see on TV, when you see like people jumping happily and like, then they give you like 30 seconds of like adverse events and side effects. We're the ones who kind of like review that once the marketing team makes it to like make sure that you are able to at least get the information that's necessary and make sure you get the risk and benefit information all together. Oh, well, thank you so much, Ernesto, for being here. Huge moves. Uh, half of you who moved across the country for some at some point. Um, uh, Norma, actually, I kind of want to learn a little more about that experience and uh, your career journey. You know, you said that after you left UCLA, um, you moved to Tucson, Arizona. So I want to know a little bit more about, you know, what your career journey looked like um, and what other roles you took on after you moved um, that led you to the position you are in today. Yes. So when I got to Tucson, I basically picked up the phone and called all the radio stations and said, are you hiring? Are you hiring? And so I was able to get an opportunity in Spanish language, um, uh, Spanish language radio station. So I was um, and then I went to a general market station, but I did uh, radio like for, I guess it was like three years or so. And then that's when I got hired by a client. At the time, uh, there was uh, Indian gaming was launched. So I worked in for a tribe uh, in Southern Arizona and helped develop their, their marketing department. And I was there and it was, it was, a, it was like my marketing um, school. I touched every element of marketing um, that you can think of. And then from there, I said, I wanna you know, um, start my own business. It was young and uh, <laughs> was full, you know, I said, I'm going to go off on my own. So I did. And I was um, helping businesses in Tucson. But then, you know, I love Tucson. It's a great, the old Pueblo is what they call it. And so they I kind of outgrew Tucson um, and I moved to Phoenix. So I moved to Phoenix in 2000. So I would, you know, like I had a wonderful experience with radio, same thing. I wanted to move to Phoenix, pick up the phone, you know, I have radio experience, can, you know, who's hiring. And, I, and then I went back to, to radio. And then I did that again for uh, three years. And again, my entrepreneurial spirit, I, I left and started my own promotional marketing company. So I hired a team, um, you know, to do um, activation execution for different brands, whether it be regional or, or national brands. And then, you know, also just different marketing, developing different marketing strategies. 2008 came along the big the great recession you know the first thing that goes usually is marketing lost a lot of business lost a lot of clients so then I had to look for work and so I, I ended back on the brand side so I was a, a director of marketing for a local company and then a regional marketing manager um, for our national company and then, but when I was the, uh, I was a regional marketing manager for HR Block, I was traveling constantly, tra you know, uh, what they call a road uh, wa warrior. You know, it was fun at the beginning, but then after a while living in the hotel rooms, you know, it's like, you know, it's not the best thing. And for uh, for personal reasons or family reasons, I, I resigned and um, to be close to family. And then, so then I ended up back in radio advertising, so. And, um, you know, I, like I said, my, my passion is helping the small business owner develop their strategy and execute. And, you know, I assist beyond just radio. So we, we offer radio advertising, but also digital advertising, which is, you know, we live, we live with our phone. So 
So if you see those little ads that pop up when you're in different apps or if you're online on different websites and you see the digital ads, I, you know, I'm responsible or my colleagues and I are responsible for those ads. So, and um, that's where I'm at now. And I'm happy, um, you know, I like, I like the flexibility, you know, we, we work different hours if there's client events, you know, there might be client events on the weekends, you know, whether it be a festival or um, at a retail store. So I work weekends and, you know, you know, not every weekend, but there'll be times that I do work weekends, but it's, it's fun. It's fun work, but it's, um, you know, I'm technically in sales, but I don't see it as sales. I see it as, you know, my, my title, my role is, you know, consultant. It's really about learning the, you know, the, the needs of the businesses of the brands and how can we generate more business for, for the clients. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I really love your experience because it's very not traditional of what I think students or anybody might think, you know, being a history, you know, major and having your bachelor's degree and then going into media um, and then just sharing like the tumultuous journeys that we have, right? Like we're not always in such a consistent job all the time or just consistent right. titles and the growth that we have. Um, so I think it's just so important to point that out, how, you know, we might change our job titles or we might change the ways that we do. Um, Absolutely. And, and it's just so important to point that out. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, and yes. in the same um, vein, I feel like there's a lot of development that you're pulling from your clients and trying to develop other areas. And I feel like, Haiti, like that's what you're doing in your role. So I'm wondering if you want to go ahead and share um, what what you do at a day to day and your career journey. Thank you. So my career journey, I think it really started just recognizing that I was very interested um, in child development. Um, I remember I first found out about even that like um, cons of that topic because my older sister went into child development. And when I learned about what that was, I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. I was like, I'd like to learn about like kids and how we become us, you know, adults. Um, so it really just kind of started there. Like I knew I liked that. It, it was natural to me. I enjoyed it. Um, and then once I started um, on my BA and working on child development, I naturally gravitated towards a lot of like volunteer opportunities that were very like people related again. So I, I was a workshop facilitator. Um, I know it was like for health things. And then at one point it was about like encouraging fresh um, high school students to go to college. So I knew I'm like, I like teaching people. I like telling them things and, you know, helping them um, develop themselves like you had mentioned. And then that kind of eventually led into me getting involved with peer mentoring programs in college. So I personally was involved in those programs. I was in two different uh, mentoring programs when I was in college. And I ended up actually working for both those programs because of the um, really like impactful experience I had as a student. Um, so my first year um, in college, I immediately started getting involved with those programs. So it kind of had gone from like, I was facilitating workshops to then being like a mentor, a peer mentor to students. And then eventually I grew within those programs. Um, so I was like a student assistant. Um, I was a residential mentor. So when freshman students would stay over the summer, like I would live there with them and I was mentoring them. And then eventually I was also the mentorship coordinator of one of those programs. So I think I just kind of kept like going up the ranks um, and I, I knew I really liked mentoring. And once it got to the point of I was about to graduate and I really had to decide like, child development is a really broad field and you can do so much with it. So I really had to decide and hone in on what I wanted to do. Um, and I was really um, like inclined to go into teaching, but I was very nervous about it. So I took a year off after I um, finished my BA and I actually was a preschool teacher in that time to kind of test the waters. Um, and I was able to kind of get a sense that I did like it. I enjoyed it. Um, so I think that solidified my choice to want to continue in education. And that's when I applied to UCLA um, and I got into the master's program. Um, so I concurrently got my master's and my teaching credential. So my second year in the program, I started teaching as a fifth grade teacher while still working on my master's. Um, and then I just went full throttle. <laughs> I stayed in the classroom for five years um, since then, and, and I loved it. Um, and it really wasn't until I think the pandemic hit and things just started to get really, really difficult in education that I think I hit a point where I had to face a lot of realities that I'm like, I love teaching, but I think being in it, a, a classroom teacher just got really difficult for like this new version of myself post pandemic. Um, so I had to recognize like I still love education and I like teaching, but I wanted to start 
exploring other capacities where I could still apply those skills. Um, and that led me to the role that I'm in now, which is the instructional and intervention coach. Um, and I was so excited when I even learned that this was a thing because it kind of took the best of all my experience, you know, there was the teaching piece, but there was still that coaching piece that I, I absolutely love. Like I love working with kids and I got a lot of experience with that, but I genuinely do also love working with adults. And so this was kind of a good medium where I get to still do a little bit of both. Um, so I was really excited to come across this job and this is my second year so far in it. Um, and I'm really happy there. So it's been cool to kind of just see that development um, and get to test so many different roles within education. Amazing. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I really like how there was just so many aspects and so many layers to that of just like how it all coincided and all um, helped build up to where you are now. <laughs> um, and it's nice when things work out that way <laughs> and, you're, and you're able to get all the support and give back to and then move your way up that way too. And and now like being on the development side of being able to support these teachers and how they're working in their classrooms. Um, that's awesome. Uh, keeping with the theme of development, I'm gonna bring it on to Gilbert as they, uh, Westport is uh, one of the companies developing, um, you know, multi-housing for unhoused individuals. So um, Gilbert, if you wanna share with us your career journey and then um, more details about what really led you to the role you're in today. Um, yeah, like I said, I started about five years ago. Uh, what led towards construction was actually my previous job. I was a, uh, I was, a, I was a general manager over at a bar called Rocco's. And, uh, one of my friends approached me with this career opportunity. And at the time I can't speak for anybody else, but I thought that, you know, construction nuts and bolts wasn't really my thing. I wasn't ready to hold a hammer in my house, let alone at a construction site. So, but he said it was, no, you know, it's more about just paperwork delegating and decided to give it a shot so i went to Reseda was my first project where we built a market rate home for 220 units and i was a project coordinator just mostly assisting the project engineer kind of shadowing them just to see if the project if it was for me since then i've gone to more of the affordable side went over and worked with nonprofits like sro um la housing path villas i'm sure i'm not sure if you can know any of those but we've built a bunch of affordable housing throughout South LA, Compton, my current project right now is in Echo Park, which is nice because I'm from there. So the same areas that I grew up in is where I'm now building and it's, you know, it's really fulfilling. And yeah, pretty much the day to day just goes with heading into the office, disseminating RFIs, any questions that the subcontractors that are, you know, the boots on the field have for the architect. Um, any changes to the subcontractor scope of work come through me. I'm the one that either approve it, you know, just to move, move their budget, you know, just paying for anything outside of their scope of work to sometimes having to decline, making sure that invoices are properly dealt with. And yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's so important to see like, like anywhere you might be, it can really lead you. Like your story really shows that it can really lead you to a place you might not have never thought before. Um, but also like your willingness to be able to give it a chance in something that you weren't you weren't even sure about, right? Like, oh, construction, like it's me holding a hammer or like me doing work, but there's so many different like layers and so many different things that are embedded into those fields. Um, so you, if you didn't even give that chance to explore it, then you wouldn't have been here where you are today. So kudos on that. Yeah, and, <laughs> and to build on that, just it's mostly a, uh... With construction, it's really lacking youth, especially Hispanic youth, to be honest, just because, as most of you know, a lot of the boots on field are Hispanic. So being able to communicate with them on a day to day basis does. You know, it's 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 a really rewarding job just going into a place where it start off, it starts off as dirt. And then by the time you're by the time you're gone, there's full families living there. Yeah, I actually live um, right off of Lancashire and Sadiqoy where the Lely family housing is and like seeing that people are going in and families are being able to move into those new buildings. Um, it's really nice to see too. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for sharing that Gilbert. Um, all right, Ernesto in keeping with the developing and that theme, um, if you care to share your career journey and how you ended up at Kite Pharma. Yeah, yeah. So thank you all for sharing previously. I like resonated with a lot of things that you all said. Um, as we were going. Uh, so I kind of briefly gave like my trajectory, but, you know, when I started college, um, you know, I knew I wanted to do something in the healthcare system. Uh, you know, I think drugs were really fascinating. 
Um, so pharmacy was like my like go to, uh, you know, the first couple of years of college were a little dicey. I'm not going to lie. I feel like I was very like unprepared coming in and it was just like very difficult to like kind of keep up and catch up. And so the whole time that I was in college, I felt like I just had to keep catching up and catching up and catching up like the first two years, especially. Um, and so I don't know. I was a little nervous because pharmacy school is very competitive and, you know, um, I was working at a pharmacy at a time. I was enjoying it for the first couple of years. And by like the third year, I, I figured that most of the medications that you get dispensed at a pharmacy, they have been approved for the past like 50 years. There's very few medications that are actually dispensed at the pharmacy that are like new. Um, and to me, what really excited me was the idea of creating new drugs and like going through like, like my molecular biology classes and all of that, and like understanding mechanisms that you could target to be able to do so. And so because I was, you know, so interested in this, because I was struggling and I really wanted to like make sure that my like application for pharmacy school would be as well rounded as possible, being a tech, being like a bio major, I like try to do go into research. And it was like these programs that were offered. It was like a winter research experience that was offered on my campus that I applied to, you know, like a Hispanic um it was a Hispanic program geared to like bringing underrepresented minorities into research for like 12 weeks. And so I did it and I was able to like get my foot in the door. And once I got my foot in the door, although it was only like a 12 week program, I was able to like stay within the lab because my PI saw that I was a hard worker and I was really interested and curious. And so I worked in the lab for like a year or so and I really loved it. Like I really loved understanding why things happened and like my specific project was just like understanding the role of the immune system in heart disease. So the, your immune system has a role in heart disease and you're like, but how does that happen? Right. And so um, after that, I kind of like saw that the opportunity to create new drugs and, and, and put those out into the world was in research. And so I kind of did like a little pivot and like, I kind of like sat down and was like, okay, am I going to go to pharmacy school or do I want to go more into like the research side of things? But the research side of things seems really daunting because like PhDs, when you think and you're an undergrad, you're like, oh my God, like you're like the subject matter expert in the field. There's like so much to learn. There's so much to take in. It's kind of scary. Um, and so I was lucky enough to find a, a research program, which is called RISE, the Research Initiative for Scientific Enhancement. There might be other programs at your, at your campus, like the MARC or like I forget the other ones, but I was able to join part of that and get funding to actually get paid to do this research instead of being like an unpaid uh, grad undergrad. Um, I was able to do research, get paid a little bit of money, which allowed me to like work less hours at the pharmacy to be able to like live when I was in college. Um, and through that, I was able to focus more time on research, able to attend conferences, able to like create posters and present those at conferences. And I decided the PhD route was the way to go. Um, it was a really nervous, like nervous time for me because at the time that I applied to graduate school, I had like a 3.3 GPA. Like my first two years were pretty like not the best. And then my last three years that I did a five-year undergrad were like pretty exceptional, but it it's hard. It's hard to like balance your GPA once it goes down um, to bring it back up. So I had a 3.3, but I had done like two years of like research. I had done like four years, five years of pharmacy technician. So when I applied to schools, I applied to like 10 different programs. Um, I heard back from like four of them. I got it back into like three of them. One of them was here at Cedar sinai where I ended up doing like one more research uh, year in like stem cells. Um, but the other one was in North Carolina and I just felt like their program was so much more like, I guess they had more options of what I wanted to do. And I kind of never got away for undergrad. And so I decided to like make this move and just go for it, just go all in. And so when I got to North Carolina, I started my PhD and that in itself was a whole nother beast that I guess we have some topics or questions that I saw on the list that I can go over. But I worked at the bench for a total of eight years, so five years in grad school, three years before grad school. And I studied like cancer therapy, how to like genetically modify your immune system outside of your body expanded outside of the body for like three to four weeks, reinfuse these cells that are alive back into a patient and be able to eliminate certain cancers, which was really like mind blowing to me. Um, so I learned the technology. And at that time I was, when I was getting ready to graduate like a year before, I decided to like apply to internships, which is something that I really encourage everyone to do. 
I always shoot your shot. I always go for those experiences because you just don't know where you're going to like land and what the, where that's going to take you. Point being, I ended up applying to like a research position at this company and I didn't want to sell myself short. So about a week later, I applied to another internship for regulatory affairs. So two different internships at the same company. And I got a call back for the research position and I give my availability, but then I got ghosted. Like I'd never heard back. And I was super bummed out because it was something that I really wanted to do. But then about like six weeks later, I got another call back for the second position and I got an interview. And during the interview process, they told me that they ended up canceling the research position because it was in person. And this was back in 2020 going into 2021. And so I was able to do my like regulatory affairs internship, um, all virtual from North Carolina, but work at this company and make those connections. And like, I never thought that I would be in regulatory affairs but I knew that I was open to new experiences and like seeing where that took me. And so after being there for three months, I learned like the regulations. I helped to launch a drug, like reviewing the promotional materials. And I thought it was something interesting and something that I could learn more of. And I was okay at that point, maybe leaving the bench. Like I wasn't opposed to like staying at the bench, but I wasn't opposed to like leaving the bench and seeing what else was out there. Because when you're in grad school, when you're in undergrad, all you hear about that's cool. if you're a PhD student or like a research student, it's like you either go the faculty route and you do research there or you go the pharmaceutical route and you do research there. But you don't really hear about the other things that you could do outside of like research in industry, for example. And so my job is very niched, to be honest. Like I feel like not many people know about it. I definitely didn't know about it, but it's a lot of like job learning. And like as long as you're motivated and as long as like you're interested, you can pick up anything and like at the end of the internship they offered me a full-time uh, opportunity and that was like the summer before of grad school so like the last year of grad school all I had to do was just focus on like finishing my work defending my PhD but like not, not having to worry about finding a job afterwards because I had a job secured like a year before and so I'm here now it's been about a year and four months that I've been at this company and um, it's completely different than what I thought I would be doing but I'm really enjoying it yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Ernesto. Um, it's huge, these different changes. Um, and all of you have so many different aspects of, you know, thinking you're going to go one route and seeing all these different opportunities and taking advantage of these opportunities. Um, and I really like how you said, Ernesto, you know, shoot your shot. Like, you really never know what could come, what aspect to come and have backup plans to that too, um, to see what you, what's available. Cause if you didn't apply to that second one, you know, who knows where you would have been, you know, um, at the end of the day. So thank you so much for, for sharing that and, um, and sharing your journey and the different routes. I mean, I had no idea that that was a job that you could be a part of and be a part of research and, you know, so you never know <laughs> what you can learn. Um, so a lot of you touched, um, on this topic of, identity a little bit um hispanic or latino or latina um and so i'm wondering what identities are important for you and how do you think that might have influenced uh, your academic or career journey i'm gonna go with haiti i think for me um as i was like getting into the age of going into college and having to figure out what I wanted to pursue I think the the identities that most kind of influence that would definitely be being first generation Hispanic coming from a low-income family I actually um, grew up in Echo Park as well in <laughs> Gilbert um, and it wasn't until just like two years ago that I lived there with uh, my family so you know I, I came from an area where like I think my, my parents knew that they really had to instill the understanding and importance of education um, and because they pushed that so much, it really, I think, resonated with me that if I wanted to grow and achieve things as as I got older, you know, that was important. And I think that stuck so much that I, I wanted to be a part of it and help other people continue to develop themselves and, and you know, really empower themselves so that when they could, you know, be adults, it would, it would also kind of, the cycle would continue essentially. So I think that was a big thing for me. Um, and then I think the piece of also being a, a woman for me in terms of my dad and always really pushing that, like I needed to be self-sufficient and um, really not rely on anyone else. I think that's where a lot of my work ethic came from and wanting to really have an established career and, and know that I could, be self-sufficient and, you know, um, have a stable life and really rely on myself. So in terms of just really pushing myself 
through undergrad and then going into my master's, I think that was a big piece too, just wanting to know that I could do these things and that um, I didn't have to rely on anyone. So powerful, hear, hear. <laughs> I totally resonate. <laughs> um, Gilbert, would you like to share? Uh, yeah, um, I guess for me, it would be a uh, first generation also, um, Hispanic from with a Salvadorian background, mostly, you know, can growing up a lot of people now I know Salvadorian is a very, you know, commonly heard uh, background, but at the time, a lot of people would always confuse it with Mexican or say what part of Mexico is El Salvadorian, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure we've all heard it a couple of times before in our lives. Um, but as far as that, with uh, my current job, it, you know, language in the world and can you repeat that sorry Gilbert you got cut off <laughs> oh I'm saying as far as as far as my as far as how it I you know how it helps me with work it's one of those things where you know it, it helps to know Spanish it's the second most spoken language in the world and especially in construction it's probably the first spoken language so it's one of those things where like with my background it's more about just working hard and no matter what it is you'll find an avenue that mostly fits you and that's what I think I've found in construction, because if it's not, you know, if it's not what I'm currently doing right now, there's is other avenues, thankfully, but it's just about, you know, keeping your head down as much as you can, working hard and trying to move forward, you know, move up and, and move up in your role. Definitely. That language component is so important and so valuable and, and marketable, you know, like a lot of individuals don't realize like people get paid because you know in the second language, you know? And so if you're able to market yourself and be like, I know the second language, I need to get paid because I know the second language, like take that opportunity for those who are second language speakers or third language speakers or want to learn a new language too. So yeah, definitely um, keep that in mind. And I am also half Salvadorian too. I know we have a few other Salvies here. <laughs> um, so it's nice to be able to see more representation and see more kindness towards Salvadorian people because I also had this similar experience where I feel like there was not enough kindness towards Salvi people <laughs> when I was growing up too. So yes. All right, Norma. <laughs> So um, I identify as, as Mexican and Chicana and, um, you know, I'm bicultural, bilingual. So that definitely has helped me um, in, in terms of my, you know, um, career, you know, because I could, you know, I could uh, create uh, marketing messages and advertising messages in both languages and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's been very beneficial um, in, in trying to, because I know your next question is on the challenges. So I'll just, I'll leave that on the, my positive note. But yes, I'm, uh, you know, being uh, low income, first generation. Yes, there's lots of challenges there. But um, just being proud of my cultural background um, has been a huge, huge asset, asset to my career. Thank you, Norma. <laughs> Ernesto? Yeah, I, I actually want to echo a lot of the things that uh, Heidi said. Um, you know, I'm first generation um, Hispanic. I come from a low income, uh, low income house, and you know, <laughs> my my mom's favorite thing that would tell me that she would tell me growing up would be like, uh, you know, your education is your inheritance. Like that's it. Like there's nothing else, right? So you know, for me, it was always about like finding somewhere where I'd be happy, but I'd be self sufficient. Um, and so that's something that you know brought me to the science world. And I do want to say, like, part of those, like, those identities that are, like, you know, it's part of you, right? But you have to bring those into every space that you're in. Because I will tell you, in the pharma industry, there's not too many people that, like, look like me and you um, in the room. And even, like, within my team, I'm the only Latino. Um, even across the cross-functional team that I work with, I'm the only Latino. And when I first joined with, during my summer internship, we had all of these materials for patients and, and everything was in English. And like, you look at our clinical trial stuff and like, there are some Latino patients that were there, not as many as there should be, but there were some Latino patients that are there and the people that get cancer, you know, don't just necessarily speak English. And so it was one thing that I was there. I was like, hey guys, like, 
I see other companies are creating resources for Spanish speaking populations, for Chinese speaking populations. Like what are we doing as a company to like address this? Because we need information, like health literate information for our Latino community. And they were like, oh yeah, like that's a that's a good point that you bring up. Like that's something that we should explore at some point, you know? And you know, being in my position now, it's something that I don't let them forget. And like, maybe I don't have the power to tell them to do it, but at least I'm in the room saying that that's something that we should be doing and advocating for, for my people and for the people who have cancer who need this information. And so I feel like those identities just come with you and bring them in every room and you know, be proud and just, be proud. <laughs> oh my gosh, that hits so hard because I'm, I'm sure others who grew up with parents who only speak Spanish and you have to go to the hospital with them and you have to be their translators. And sometimes, you know, we're no sabo kids, like we don't have the greatest like English, de like Spanish development or our foreign language development, you know. Um, and so that's so important to be able to have that support and that advocacy. So thank you, Ernesto, for always, always putting that forth and for, you know, not just Spanish, but any foreign languages as, you know, we see that, you know, cancer is not discriminant, you know, it, it hurts all. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing that um, and those identities. And I'm wondering, um, you know, we're all are gonna talk a little bit about this or Norma, I'll, I'll go to you since um, you wanted to save it for this question. It's just how your ethnic identity or other identities that you shared with us today factored into challenges you faced in professional spaces. Well, I think I, I would start for my college experience. So I went from high school to UCLA and in a lot of classrooms, you know, I did um, feel like I was an imposter. And, you know, although I had excellent, um, you know, um, support systems, you know, and it, it's, it's hard not to let it bother you. And I think that, uh, you know, that in the fact that even, you know, I graduated and everything, but I still, even after I graduated, I do to feel like I was an imposter. And I think that, you know, limited me to pursue a graduate school. And that's, you know, been, you know, one of my biggest, you know, I guess, um, I guess, I don't like to use the word regrets, but, you know, something that I, I wish it would have been, the circumstances would have been different. And, you know, I'm talking what, how many years ago, many, you know, things have changed, but, you know, and for the better, we do, we definitely have a lot more to, to grow. And I mean, in terms of our community growing, you know, but it, it was, it was, it was a different time. It was a little, I, I think, um, harder when I was going to school than it is now. Um, but so that would be one thing. And of course, you know, being from a low income and first generation didn't have, you know, my family's guidance you know and again even though I said I do have I did have you know I was involved with pretty much every you know you know key organization on campus which is huge but that really helped me stay in college and graduate but then once you leave then you're kind of back to on your own so I think it's important after you graduate to reach out to other organizations and always keep um, in touch with organizations since it's, it's like I said it's 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 better but we still have a long way to go so we need to support each other constantly constantly support each other yeah thank you so much for sharing that yeah that that social cultural wealth that community that we are able to build sometimes we leave the school and we're, we have to find that again you know we're a community college and a lot of students do find family do find a home here at the community college and transitioning to a four-year college that can be difficulty there but um, yes as students uh, have been able to find it here they should feel confident that they can continue to find it elsewhere too yeah. yes it is key your support system is definitely key yeah thank you thank you Norma. Katie? Um, I echo a lot of what Norma said uh, when she said imposter. I was like, yeah, that's in my notes. I was like, that's what I wrote. Um, I think it was a mixture of like all those identities I mentioned, like they put these really high expectations and this pressure on myself that I, I had to do good. I had to do good. 
Um, but at the same time, not feeling good enough and, and always feeling like there was a lot of doubt in my ability and in um, other people being able to see my ability, um, you, no matter how many years of experience I had, you know, I just always still felt like I didn't belong in that room. Um, and I think one of the the things that I think like Norma had mentioned, like, I, I don't think it's a regret, but that I wish I would, I would have understood things a little differently at that point when I was going to undergrad and I had to apply to schools. I didn't apply to any UCs at the time because at that point I just felt like, oh, I'm not UC material. Like, I don't know, I can't get into those. So I didn't bother. Um, and you know, I don't regret going to, to um, CSUN. I loved it. Um, it was an incredible experience. But once I got to my master's and I really liked the program at UCLA, like I had to face that again, you know, do I think I am, you know, UC material? And at that point I was like, I am. And so I, you know, shot my shot and I got in um, and I felt very proud. And it was a good moment of realizing like I was always UC material, like I was the one limiting myself. Um, so definitely feeling a lot of that imposter syndrome. But I think the more I've learned about myself and been able to feel pride in who I am, um, I've been able to push that a little more. <laughs> yes, I like the reiteration. Shoot your shot. <laughs> so, Go yes. yes. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. You never know where it can end up. You could be in any of these positions that these wonderful people are in right now. Gilbert? Yeah, um, yeah, the same to piggyback off of uh, Norma. It's uh, the, the biggest challenge has always been feeling out of place, uh, you know, coming from construction I never really felt in place just with the uh, background because you know most of most most of the people there come from a construction background so just that alone was a challenge uh thinking of things such as you know coming from a lower income family as something that's negative when reality it's real positive you get a lot of life experience from there so you know that's always been one of the biggest challenges but Going back, it's just finding a good support system within your family, your colleagues, and uh, your friends. It just helps you realize that everything that we've been going through up until this moment has been for a reason. And, you know, and there's a lot more positive to come out of these things than negativity. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gilbert. Ernesto. Yeah, so, so similar to what everybody said, um, imposter syndrome was always a big thing. Um, and that's something that I feel like you kind of just never never necessarily get over you kind of just find ways to like mitigate it and like you know you know, remind yourself that you know you are where you're supposed to be and like you've done all these things I like to go back to my resume and I'm like oh shit okay I did all of that um but no there was a lot of isolation um well I guess let me backtrack so I went to school at Castle Long Beach we're in LA LA is like 50 percent Latino right like to me I was just like another person on the street I wasn't I was in college and like there was a lot of like Latinos around me. It just felt like normal, like normal life. Uh, you get up, you uproot your life from your Southern California life to North Carolina, which is the South. You go from 50% Latino all around you and diversity, not just Latinos, to North Carolina. It's like 10% Latino. Uh, the majority of the Latino population are immigrants that live in the rural areas. Um, I'm in the like city area. I'm in higher education. So that 10% goes from like 10% to like 4% to like 1% in higher education in North Carolina. And so arriving there, there was a, my cohort of students, it was a hundred, no, there was 90, I feel like 98 students who joined that cohort over the, there's 14 different PhD departments. So each department gets about like, I don't know, between five to 10 students. And that first cohort of 100 students, I was one of four Latinos. Uh, I was one out of two Mexicans out of uh, 98 people, 100 people. And so just arriving there, it just feels like you're out of place again, right? Like you like, how do I, how do I navigate these spaces first? I don't have my family around me. I don't have my friends around me. I don't have people that look and think like me around me. It just feels weird. So there was a lot of isolation. There was a lot of imposter syndrome there was a lot of navigating that going to grad school working with people a lot of microaggressions um, that you kind of just experience uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that I guess sometimes you just take for granted but like not granted but kind of you kind of just dismiss them but you kind of just build up and build up and you feel so isolated that 
it just it just sucks right so building this community and like around you and like finding other people around me was like really the key to surviving and I, I thriving honestly in graduate school um you know i i was part of the society for the advantage of chicanas and uh, native americans in science at like unc i like found my little bubble i found my little group i found ways to get back to the latino community um and all of those things, I honestly can say, like, if I hadn't found my little group, if I hadn't, like, focused, like, my time and in building that community around me, I don't know if I would have survived graduate school, if I'm being super frank with you. So um, it was a it was a whole ass experience moving to North Carolina, y'all, not going to lie. But honestly, uh, you know, we, we came out winning, so it's all good. <laughs> exactly yeah I think it's so important finding that community finding allies um you know who maybe aren't a part of your community or have the similar experience but are willing to like be able to support to engage to push the boundaries of or the status quo right of um the system so so yeah it's so important um I, I want to go back Ernesto just because you really did touch upon like the personal challenges in the pursuit of education I'm wondering if there's anything in particular that really stood out to you and the personal challenges you might have um, faced as you you know finished up your education really recently you're now in, you're fresh in your career path or even even in your personal life and maybe like how you created that support system and mentors to be able to overcome those challenges yeah I mean my thing has always been ask for help if you ask for help you will find it somewhere uh so in undergrad you know I would always like connect with professors that would always connect with other peers, but in graduate school, like I said, there was not too many people. And so when I uh, decided to like join SACNAS, which is the Society for Graduates of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, super long name, uh, you know, I found a little group. I was like the vice president, I was a president, I was a treasurer, I was a secretary. But through those connections, like I met like another professora, right? Like what the, the only like Latina professora at, like in the science at UNC. And she was involved at the national board level of SACNAS, um, Dr. Patricia Silveira. And she, you know, she approached me and she was like, hey, like, we want you to be part of like the national board. Um, you want, we want you to be the graduate student representative. And so like, I guess just continuously building that community in larger aspects and be able to like mentor and even give back and share your experiences just makes you feel it's a rewarding experience and it makes you feel like all of those things that you've been through and, and went through, you know, you're able to at least put a positive spin on that and be able to like contribute back to people who maybe be, feel the same way as you and who are in the same place as you. And so I feel like a lot of positive things happened after the negatives and it, it, it kind of just, you know, all, all balanced out at the end, but community, wealth and community building is just is just where it's at thank you Ernesto Heidi I think um one of the personal challenges I I faced um was I think something that built up a lot over time but it really kind of came to like a screeching halt um, during the pandemic when things started to really escalate in terms of like how difficult it was to be in the classroom. Um, and when we came back to, to teaching after um, the full year of distance learning, um, my, my mental health was like really, really suffering. Um, and I don't think I had realized over the course of so many years because I was so hyper-focused with like do getting my job and like you know doing good in school that I had like really lost kind of like my identity both like in personal but also like within work I think I lost myself so much to like being a teacher um so it really came to the point of like me having to do so much self-reflection and being really vulnerable with myself and I you know I went to therapy and having to really face a lot of things um it was really hard to get to a point of coming to terms of like, am I going to leave my job? Am I going to leave teaching? Like this thing that I have worked so, so hard for, like, oh, it was so hard to, to get to that point. Um, but then I think I got to that point and realized that education was such a huge field. And, you know, even if it wasn't education, I had all these skills that could completely translate to another field. You know, there's still coaching, coaching and mentoring in, in many other fields. Um, 
So I think it just got to that point where I realized, you know, that I needed to still continue to take care of myself and that this idea I had of myself of, of what my career would be didn't have to just be that one path. And I had to be very open to what else the future could bring. Um, so, you know, I in terms of my support system, I really reached out to my loved ones, my colleagues at work, my mentors at work. Um, and I think they all made me feel so safe in my decision of stepping away from the classroom um, that I finally felt empowered enough to do it and like go into the the unknown and figure out what was next for me um so definitely reaching out to my loved ones and you know being willing to to be vulnerable with myself yeah and thank you so much for sharing the fact that you also you see saw you know mental health too because that's another way that we're able to build that um kind of community like our therapists can really be able to be that soundboard that sometimes you know our families and our friends they have a lot of opinions a lot of things they want to say but we just really need someone to listen to us out and have us work things through so yeah thank you for sharing that Gilbert I'm sorry I'm sorry what was the question again um so personal challenges that you might have experienced in the pursuit of your career path or personal life and maybe how you created connections or support to help overcome any of those challenges you might have faced yeah um personal challenges just probably uh started off with educational background i'd probably say um but as far as overcoming it it's goes back just to you know just having a good support group especially going with um what Haiti was saying with just with mental health in general, you know, you, you could really just go down on yourself, go down a dark path, thinking that you're not meant to be there, you know, especially transitioning from something like uh the restaurant industry to construction that I didn't know at all it was took a toll at first, but just, you know, just giving it a chance, taking your time with it and being open to learning just something new, just because in any of our fields, you learn something new every day. So you can just go in with that mentality alone. Thank you, Gilbert. Yeah, it's so important um, being able to be able to transition, right? Um, and feel comfortable. Like those transitions are where we are challenged the most sometimes. Um, and we do need that as support. So thank you for, for sharing that. That's important. Norma? So, you know, community building, networking, just developing relationships, relationships is a lifelong process. I mean, or, or it's something you have to constantly do throughout your life. It doesn't matter how many years you've been in, in a field or in, in, you know, industry. I, you know, I've been in marketing advertising for many years, but just like life, you know, we make we pivot, we changes, we have ups and downs and, and, um, but having being mindful that you need that support system on a on a regular basis on a daily basis you know like you brush your teeth just be mindful you need that support system and it's something that you that is necessary throughout your career because then it doesn't matter how long you've been in, in in your industry or if you make or you go into a new field it's just it's a lifelong um thing to do so yeah <laughs> Thank you so much, Norma. Um, so we're not going to get to our last question, but we did have a question in the chat um, for Ernesto based on your um, discussion of uh, your research that you were doing in the lab. Um, would your technology help with MS patients as well? Is that an area you're focusing on? That's a really fantastic question. And so this technology has really so much room for opportunity and growth for autoimmune diseases. Um, so the way that our, pretty much the way that our technology works is that we take out your T cells, which is an immune immune cell. Um, and they pretty much are your, like your killer cells within your immune system. And what we do is that we genetically engineer them. So we put a, a DNA into them and that makes them express a receptor on the cell surface. And this cell, as a, this receptor can recognize a protein that's found on another cell B cells, um, that's on all B cells, and we target cancers that derive from B cells, right? So if you can imagine if there is, for example, a, I'm going to say another different type of autoimmune disorder like lupus, lupus is mediated by B cells, 
And so if we use the same technology in patients that are experiencing lupus, if we get rid of those B cells, we get rid of the disease. And so, yes, there is opportunities to go after autoimmune diseases. Um, MS, I think, I don't remember, it's, it's immune cell mediated, but there is an opportunity to target specific cell types that are causing diseases. And yeah, the technology is immature. Uh, it's currently being um, assessed in autoimmune diseases. Though. So short answer, yes, potential. <laughs> Awesome. If people have questions, um, are you okay if um, anybody can email you if they could want to follow up with you and chat more about your research? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Feel free to share my email. I'm also going to plug in my LinkedIn. Feel free to connect, uh, send me a message. Um, I also dropped in an opportunity that I saw on my LinkedIn for community college students who are interested in biotech and pharma. So if you're interested in that, it's a summer internship for 12 weeks, similar to what I did. Um, and so check it out, apply, shoot your shot. You never know. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I don't want to take too much of your time because you dedicated just an hour for us today to be able to share your experiences, um, your knowledge. Um, and so I really, from the bottom of my heart, do really appreciate y'all being so vulnerable and open and willing to, um, join with us in community today and share your wonderful stories and journeys. And maybe in the future, we'll be able to have you back and learn about something new. So thank you so much, um, to Gilbert, Gilbert to Haiti, to Norma, to Ernesto for being here with us and all of you for joining um, in the audience too. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.